Today we're in chapter 5. We're going to look at a very powerful subject, a subject I have to be honest with you as I, I bring it to you today, a subject that many people actually shy away from on a personal level. It's not that they don't want to learn these things, but many of us want to learn the things that we will see in this passage today. We want to learn those things by reading about them and hearing the stories that others have uh, of what others have experienced. So we're going to be looking at what the Lord would have for us today in a passage found here in Matthew chapter 5. And so we'll look at verse 4. Matthew chapter 5 verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. If there's anything that binds humanity together, it's that all of us, in one form or another, have suffered loss. All of us. We all experience it. We can experience loss. We experience disappointment, failure, Uh, We've all experienced a tragedy, a tragedy, fear, disappointment, sorrow that we wish that we could escape from. When we go through pain, we, we wish that it was something that we could actually hide from or just not have. We can go through a time of illness, prolonged illness, serious illness that causes us to cry out to God for help. One of the things that I love about the Psalms is they're very real. They're very authentic. You'll read many of the Psalms uh, that were written by, by David or others that basically bring a complaint to the Lord or a cry out to God for help. And one of those Psalms would be Psalm 6. And notice what he says in verses 2 and 3. He says, Have compassion on me, Lord, for I am weak. Heal me, Lord, for my body is in agony. I am sick at heart. How long, O Lord, until you restore me. I mean, that's a common cry that many of us have had. God, I've gone through this prolonged illness. I'm going through a time of heaviness of soul, and and the pain is is causing me to go through a spiritual sense of depression. Lord, how long am I going to go through this? When are you going to deliver me? This kind of pain can cause us to go through a time of mourning over what we're experiencing. You see, some kinds of sorrow that we experience are simply the sorrows that are shared by all of humanity. They're things that are common to man. We have a loved one who dies or a friend who becomes ill. The company that we're working for downsizes or we personally go through an illness or one of our children becomes ill. These are the kinds of things that are simply part of living in this fallen world. They're common to all. There are other things that can result in mourning. And it may be that the things that we begin to experience are the result, really, of of poor choices that I've made. Because I can make some very poor choices, and and sometimes I will begin to reap the consequences of choices that I've made, and it causes me to be grieved, to be greatly sorrowful. I, I can indulge my sinful passion, but I ultimately reap the consequences. I had a young lady years ago now approach me after a service, and she said, Pastor, can you pray for me? And I said, of course, what can I pray for? And she said, well, I was intimate with a young man. I think I'm pregnant. Can you pray for me? And I asked her, what do you want me to pray for? Are you asking me to pray that God will remove this child from your womb? Because there are those who who will do something like that, and And they end up saying, oh, God, remove this from me or take this from me. When in reality, what happens is you reap the consequences of a poor choice. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 says, don't be misled. Remember that you can't ignore God and get away with it. You will always reap what you sow. And that's true. If you sow to the flesh, from the flesh you reap corruption. And so if you sow through bad choices and bad behaviors to your flesh, you can reap the consequences, and it can cause you to have a sense of sorrow and mourning. Well, when the sorrow that we experience is legitimate, that can be a sorrow that actually leads us to depth in our souls. 
Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 2 through 4 says it like this. It is better to go to a house of mourning than to a house of feasting, for death is the destiny of everyone. The living should take this to heart. Frustration is better than laughter, because a sad face is good for the heart. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. You learn deeper lessons going to a funeral than to a banquet. And that's the point he's making. Because every one of us who have gone to funerals have seen sorrow. We've seen the pain. We've seen the suffering. We've seen the agony. Now, I began very early as a, a young boy to attend funerals. And, and I do remember the sorrow that I encountered as a young boy. I had a cousin named Richie. Richie was from Venice. And... Uh, he was a heroin addict, and uh, he happened to be a very special cousin to me. He was about 17 at the time, and Richie overdosed on heroin. And so I went to his funeral, funeral with my, my mom and dad and, and brother, and he, he had overdosed and died in a field, an empty field, and had laid there dead for several days. And so ants had consumed his face. So he had a closed casket. He was the only son of my aunt, Tilly, and uh, the light of her life. And I remember going to that funeral and being seated in that, in that chapel and hearing the message and then going to the graveside and then seeing my aunt as she jumped on top of the casket before they put it in the ground and, and how that might my dad and one of my uncles had to go and peel my aunt off that casket and then put their arms around her and as she was screaming, Richie, Richie, Richie. And, and we've all seen something like that. We've all been around that. I was in a lot of parties, partied an awful lot, but I learned the deepest lessons going to funerals because sorrow deepens you, because it awakens us to the fact that we only have one life to live. And as a Christian, I realize all that I do for Christ is what is going to remain. And so I ought to do those things for him. You learn great lessons through mourning. We can become more mature in times of sorrow than when things are going well. There's a, poem, a poet by the name of Robert Browning Hamilton, and he said it this way. He said, I walked a mile with pleasure. She chatted all the way, but left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow, and ne'er a word said she, but oh, the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. You learn deeper lessons when you go through tough times. And so there is a sorrow that the world understands. There's a sorrow that is common to all humanity. There's a sorrow that comes from simply being alive. There's a sorrow that comes from reaping the consequences of poor choices. In this particular passage, Jesus is giving to us another kind of sorrow. He's speaking of something that goes beyond those natural kinds of sorrows that we can experience. He's specifically speaking of what would be called godly sorrow. So this is a sorrow that someone who sincerely wants to follow him or belongs to him, this is that kind of sorrow that they can have. It's the kind of sorrow mentioned in 2 Corinthians 7, 10, where Paul calls it godly sorrow. He says, godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. And so Jesus is speaking about godly sorrow. Now, in the first beatitude, remember how Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those uh, rejoicing, how happy, how how, how greatly rejoicing are you uh, when you realize your spiritual poverty? How blessed are you when you realize that you are a beggar crouching in a corner with your hand out asking for mercy from God because that's how you get saved. You see, the only way someone can come to Christ is to first recognize that they are spiritually bankrupt. We can't bring anything to Christ other than the sins he forgives us for, and we fall upon the ground before him. This is Christianity, by the way. We fall on our faces before him in repentance, asking for forgiveness. We are 
poor in spirit. I can't do it. I can't pay this bill. I need your help, God. It's a spiritual, a spiritual debt that I owe that I cannot pay. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. There's an old hymn that simply says, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Well, the second beatitude says, blessed are those who mourn, they shall be comforted. Blessed are you who mourn. That word mourn speaks of having great sorrow, to grieve. It speaks of a deep inner agony. Now, is this just the normal ability to grieve? No, of course not. We can grieve over the wrong kinds of things. We can grieve because we missed a chance to sin. Somebody has harmed us and we're upset and there they are. And I have perfect opportunity to take vengeance on them. And I don't. And later on, I may regret that. Or I have an opportunity to, to steal something. Man, it's there out in the open. Nobody would see if I took it. And then later on you can grieve because you didn't take advantage of that opportunity. You know, before I got saved, and this ought to cause some of you to trust me mightily right now, I was a thief. That's what I was. Stole jackets, stole T-shirts. I'd sell the T-shirts and I'd buy drugs with them. Some of you did the same kind of thing. I was a thief. And I have a friend of mine, his name's Bill. And Bill and I have been friends since we were, well, we met each other in kindergarten. So we were five years old when I first uh, became acquainted with a young little boy named Bill. Became my close friend as we grew older. So Bill and I, you know, we were little hoodlums together, you know, as kids. You know, we stole wine and cars and, you know, normal kid stuff. Um, he became a police officer, 32 years in the police force, and I became a pastor. <laughs> amazing, huh, when you think about it? Really amazing. Smoked dope together for the first time, got drunk together for the first time. I mean, he was like a brother more than just a friend to me, and we were little hoodlums together for a long time, many years. Well, he knew me very well. Bill got saved recently, and uh, long story, I'll make it short, he got saved. After he got saved, he's been meeting with me. He's been meeting with me now once a month for about three years, two to three years. And what Bill will do is he'll come to my office, and he'll sit down, and he comes with a friend of mine, another friend that I've known since I was 14, his name's Bobby. So Bill will come and Bobby will come those two old men and me, and, uh, and Bill will take out a, a sheet of paper. He always does the same thing. He does this. He'll go like this, and he'll put it down on the table. And it's two pages of question. And he will ask me question after question after question for two to two and a half hours every time he comes. Well, what about this? And what does this scripture mean about that? So I've been discipling and mentoring and ministering to my dear friend who I've known since we were kids for about two or three years now. So the first time he comes, and he comes to with his questions, I say to him, you want to grab some lunch? And so he, Bobby, and I go to a restaurant in the area, and as we go to the restaurant, we have our meal, and we're leaving to come back here to the office. As we're walking out of the restaurant, we're going through this area where off to my right is a door, an open door, and straight through the door is the uh, refrigerator. And in the refrigerator, is a large refrigerator. In that refrigerator is all kinds of beer. I mean, all kinds of beer. It's just stocked, loaded with beer. So Bill and I, the very first time that I'm meeting with them, first time that we get together, first time we go out for lunch, we're walking out, and I look at that refrigerator, and I look back down, and he stops. And he says, I know what you're thinking. I go, what? He says, you're thinking how easy it would be to get some of that beer, aren't you? I said, yeah. I said, look at it, man. It's just in the open. It's in the open, Bill. I said, I could slide that and I could get us some, yeah. He knew me from when I was 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. That's what I would have done. 
He knew it. And the first thing he does, and, we, and, and I'm talking to him about Jesus. He says, look at that. You, want, you could, I, said, I don't want to steal that beer, but it sure would be easy. It would be easy. You know, there are things that you, I got saved and got saved out of. But there are times when I was younger that I, I saw a truck, and it was one of those trucks that carried cases of beer. And, and I would say to myself, man, he stacked those beers outside, went into the store. I could have taken a case. And you can regret that. Even, and I don't, I don't, I don't. <laughs> Bill does. <laughs> but what I'm saying is it's true. You can, you can say, man, I wish I would have taken vengeance. Man, I should have stolen that. Should have slept with that person there. There are a lot of things you could have done. And then you say, oh, man, I should have done that. There's, there's a possibility to grieve over the wrong kinds of things. Jesus is, of course, not speaking of that. He's, he's speaking here over sorrowing over sin. Again, the first beatitude, you recognize spiritual poverty, but now... We mourn over our sin. Again, that's a godly sorrow. Today, people say, why do you get so worked up over that? It's no big deal. Don't worry about it. Don't take it so seriously. It's no big deal. Sin is sin. Everybody does it. Don't worry about it. Listen, if a person has the idea that it's just a little sin and it doesn't matter, they don't understand the cost what, it, what Jesus paid when he died on the cross. They don't. They haven't learned yet to hate the sin that put them on the cross. They haven't learned that yet. If a person thinks that sin is small, it's like kissing the tip of the spear that was plunged into the side of Christ. When you don't see that sin Put your Savior on the cross, and it's huge. You have yet to understand the cost that Jesus paid to save you. We ought to grieve over our sin. It killed Jesus. If you've been in this church for a while, all of you know, and if you haven't, I'll share this briefly, that my daughter Corinne, many years ago, made some very poor choices became pregnant out of wedlock. She gave birth to a little boy who is my heart, my Josiah. And I love that baby with every beat of my heart. I love him. But my heart broke when her pregnancy came in the way that it did. I came before the church and I shared. And someone said, more than one, but someone said, why is David so upset? And the answer came from the person they asked, because he's a righteous man, and he grieves over sin. I had people say to me, or to us, you're going to love your grandson or granddaughter. Well, guess what? That never was in question. That was never in question. Of course I'm going to love that baby my baby. I'd never deny that baby. That's my baby. Of course I'm going to love. But please, please don't think there's something wrong with me for grieving over the way that happened. It broke my heart. It ought to break your heart if you raised them to know Christ. But when we minimize it, it's no big deal. 80% of some communities, the girls are giving birth to babies out of wedlock. What's the big deal? The big deal is first comes love, then comes marriage, and then comes Corinne with the baby carriage. <laughs> That's how it works. <laughs> Very deep scripture, right? I gave you some wisdom from Solomon on that one. But that's, that's how it works. Do not minimize sin. It's kissing the tip of the spear that was plunged into the side of Christ. Grieve over it. It's wrong. It's wrong. And we ought to have a sorrow. That's the step that comes after realizing your spiritual poverty. Blessed are those who mourn. 
who mourn over sin. There are some in, in, in pulpits today who preach a message that omits sin and, and it's having a terrible effect in the church. I know of one particular man, he's on TV, he gives a message that has, never uses the word sin, it never speaks of holiness, it never speaks of eternal judgment, and never speaks of any of the cardinal things in Scripture that you find when you read your Bible. And at the end of every one of his segments, he, he says, just pray this simple prayer with me and you can become a Christian. He doesn't even preach repentance. And yet people flock to his ministry, want to hear him. There are people who occupy pulpits that omit the word sin, repentance, holiness, and judgment. And instead of encouraging people to be forgiven, they actually are promising them blessings. The Old Testament prophet Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 14 would say, they have also healed the hurt of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. See, the only way that you can have peace is when you mourn, when you say, God, forgive me, a sinner. God, be merciful to me. I was raised as a Catholic. Many of you were too. I went to the Latin Mass, and in a certain portion of the Latin Mass, we would smite our breast, and in Latin, we would say, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. How many of you have heard that before? Mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. My fault, my fault, my most grievous fault. And that into my understanding of mourning over sin. It isn't somebody else's blame. It's not them. It is me. It is my fault. You mourn over sin. God forgive me a sinner. King David. If I say David and, what's the next word that you would use? David and Bathsheba. Right? David and Bathsheba. Why? The man wrote most of the Psalms. If you open up your Bible, read the 150 Psalms, over 70 of those Psalms are written by David himself. He is called the sweet psalmist of Israel. Concerning David, God himself said, he is a man after my own heart. And yet, when you speak concerning David, he was handsome, he was powerful, he was mighty, he was a man's man. But when you speak of King David, and I say, David and, you don't say Goliath. Some did, wrong. Bathsheba, <laughs> David and Bathsheba. Why? Because that's what he's famous for. In a time when kings went out to war, David remained behind. While his armies were out fighting battles he should have been leading, he stayed in the palace. And he's up there walking around, looking down the hill in his palace, and he sees a beautiful woman bathing, and the blood begins to boil in this man. And he says, bring that woman to me. And he is told, is she not Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah? Uriah was one of David's mighty men. He had a select crew of men. Uriah would have been equivalent to a naval seal. He was a mighty man. Is not Uriah one of your men, that's his wife. David says, bring her to me. She comes, she even warns him that she's fertile and can become pregnant. He didn't care, and he consummates his desire on her. He could have had any woman who was unmarried in his kingdom. He was the king. He wanted another man's wife. David discovers, he is told, She's with child. What am I going to do? Bring Uriah in off the field. I want to talk to him. Uriah comes in. David's trying to cover his sin. Well, Uriah, why don't you go on home and be with your wife? But Uriah was a very noble man. Shall I have pleasure while my men are out in the field? No. Uriah chooses not to go and be with Bathsheba. David brings him in a second time even gives them a little wine this time, gets them a little drunk. Why don't you go home? Most drunk men want to be with their wives. Why don't you go home? He doesn't go. It's told him, David, you didn't go. What am I going to do? Well, 
he comes up with a plan. He says, put, De put Uriah in the, in the most dangerous part of the battle, in the heat of the battle, the hottest part, withdraw your troops. And that's exactly what happens. Uriah's there, he's fighting loyally for his king. The troops leave him isolated and he's killed. Not only was Uriah killed, but when word came to David, the word came and said, not only was Uriah, but several of your men died alongside of him, died in the same battle. David's sin not only was responsible for a pregnancy in an adulterous relationship, but also in the death of the husband and innocent lives. So what did David do? He waited until he felt it was an appropriate time, and he marries Bathsheba. He thinks that he can cover his sin by just marrying this woman. It took about a year for the Spirit of God to finally break through the hardened heart of David. And David writes concerning that. He wrote two Psalms, Psalm 32 and Psalm 51, both of them speaking concerning of this one sin with Bathsheba. And in Psalm 51, verses 1 through 3, he said in this Psalm, Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. Because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize my shameful deeds. They haunt me day and night. I, I can't get away from it. The, the sin, the memory of it, 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 it is haunting me. It's there with me whether I'm asleep or whether I'm awake. I am constantly thinking of this one thing. Have mercy on me. You see, until sin is confessed and forsaken... Joy is locked outside. And Jesus is simply saying to us, mourning over sin brings happiness because it leads to confession of sin. And David would agree. Psalm 32, verses 3 through 5, when I refused to confess my sin, I was weak and miserable. I groaned all day long. Day and night your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide them. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord. You forgave me. All my guilt is gone. You see, some are living in a sinful way. They know it. And they're surprised that the joy is no longer there. And that's because sin and happiness are mutually exclusive. And it doesn't return until sin is confessed, repented of, and forsaken. And at that time, you can actually have joy. Psalm 32, 1 and 2, David said, Oh, what joy for those whose rebellion is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those who record the Lord, whose, whose record the Lord has cleared of sin, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. And so when God forgives us of our sin, it, it results in a life that, that can have a depth, a, a sobriety of character even. Now, listen, when I talk about being sober-minded and, and all, that doesn't mean that you can't laugh and have a good sense of humor. I think that the church went through a period at one time, and sometimes there's still places like this where laughing in, in church was considered sinful. And the holier you were, the, the sadder you looked. It's a terrible time in the church. I've got a terrible sense of humor. I do. I got it from my dad, and I got it from my mom. My mom was real witty. She was real quick with one-liners. My dad was a practical joker. So I got both of their senses of humor in me. Let me give you an example. I was about eight years old or so. My dad used to go, now some of you are young, let me give you a history lesson. You see Sears all over the place now. When I grew up in the 50s, there was only one big Sears. It was in L.A. They had little outlets in Norwalk and stuff, but you had one big Sears store. It was in Los Angeles. My dad worked in L.A., and so my dad would stop at Sears sometimes on the way home to buy a tool or something for his, uh, to work at home. And he would stop by the candy. There was a little candy place there, and he would buy these peanuts that were candy-coated. And I loved those peanuts. My brother and I loved them. And we would just hope that dad had gone to Sears that day. And we would go into his truck when he rolled up. And we would open the glove box. And we would look for those peanuts. And, and one day, I still remember, my brother Frank and I went out there, opened up the glove box. Bingo, there are some of these candies. 
And we opened them up, and we started eating them by the handful. Ate about half of the bag of candy that my dad had, rolled it back up, put it back in the glove box, closed the glove box, went into the house. <laughs> when we walked in, my dad said, you boys weren't in my truck, were you? No. <laughs> oh, I thought maybe you'd have gone in the truck. You didn't go in the truck? No. You didn't climb in the truck and open up the glove box, did you? No. Oh, so if you'd have climbed in my truck, opened up the glove box, you'd have seen a bag in there. But you didn't see any bag in there, did you? No. Because if you'd have opened up that bag and you would have looked in it, looks like candy? You didn't look in there, right? No. Because if you'd have eaten that candy, it's not candy. It's spider poison. <laughs> spider poison? Oh, yeah, it's very dangerous. I went to Sears today and I bought spider poison because of all the spiders in the backyard. And you wouldn't want to eat that. Why, Daddy? <laughs> oh, because it, it can kill you. You could die. Good thing you didn't eat any of it. Yeah. And he says, if you ate it, you know what you'd have to do so you don't die? What? You'd have to lay down and take a nap. My brother goes, you know, I'm really sleepy. I, I, I'm going to take a nap. And I said, y you know, so am I. And my brother and I went and lay down in our bedroom on our bed waiting to die for about an hour. That was my dad. My dad used to do things like that. He was terrible. He was terrible. So I'm sitting in my car years ago, and my son Dave's about six. Marie's in the store, and she's grocery, getting some groceries, and I stayed with Dave in the car, and, and I'm looking out the window, but I can see his reflection off the glass. And I see him open up my glove box, and I had candy in it. And I see him very quietly reaching in, eating it. And I just gave him a chance to eat a few. And then I made a movement, and, and I saw him close it up. And I turned in, I looked at him. I said, oh, by the way, I forgot. I should tell you, son, you, you wouldn't go in that, in that glove box, would you? No. I said, that's good, because there's a bag in there, and it looks like it has candy, but it's spider poison. <laughs> and he goes, really? I said, oh, yeah, it's very dangerous. But it's a good thing you didn't eat it. No, I didn't eat it, Daddy. That's a good thing that you didn't eat it, because if you did, it could kill you. It could? Yes. But there is a way to keep from dying. What is that, Daddy? Well, you have to cross your eyes, stick your tongue out, and you have to put your hands over your chest and stick your feet straight out. And that'll keep you from dying. It will? Yeah. So I look out the window. Then I see him moving. I turn around. He's got his tongue sticking out, his arms, <laughs> his feet, crossing his eyes. And he goes, I like doing this, Daddy. My father still lives. My fa See, so there's nothing wrong with being silly, okay, and having a silly sense of humor. As a matter of fact, laughter is like medicine. Of course you should laugh. But a lot of people think, oh, you know, we're mourning constantly, walking around with a sad face. No, we have joy because our sins are forgiven. But the way for our sins to be forgiven is by mourning. It deepens you. It strengthens you. And so when we're truly mourning, it's not even about us anyway. We're not focusing on ourselves. We're not even focusing just on our sin. When we mourn, we're actually, get this, we're actually focusing on God and how that has affected our relationship and what it's done concerning his majesty. And we're repenting from the sin that has separated us from him. Again, like David said in Psalm 51, 4, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak justified when you judge. 
The evidence of a maturing Christian isn't sinlessness. It's actually a growing awareness of your sinfulness. It's a sense of the need for God. That God may hold you up. And God may sustain you. It's an awareness that it's God who carries you. So instead of having a kind of shallow attitude of life, you have a sobriety. And what happens when you have that? Well, Jesus said it. You shall be comforted. God's comfort comes when we mourn and we deepen in our walks with him. When you mourn, God makes himself more present and we experience his comfort. It's like what it says in Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those who are crushed in spirit. When my uh, children were young and small and they would, they would be hurt and they would be crying, as evil as I am, and I'm an evil father, you can ask them, they'll tell you. As evil as I am, when I saw my babies hurting and they were crying, I would sit next to them, I would pull them near me, I would take the tears that sometimes stream down their face, and I would, with my thumb in my hand, I would wipe the tears from their eyes. Not only that, but I would draw them close to me, and I would kiss them, and the little, where they were crying, their little cheeks, and I would kiss them, and I would say, and I would rock them. And oh, by the way, that didn't stop when they were little. I've done that when they've been old. When they've been old, I've held my children and I've rocked them and I've kissed them and I've loved them because they're my babies. And I do that with my grandchildren. If one of them's crying, I just recently, I just doing this, just wipe the little tears from their eyes, draw them to myself, and I tell them how deeply I love them and how they're going to be okay and God's going to take care of them. That's what I do. And I'm an evil father. But my God, he comforts me when I mourn. He, he, in a way, in a way, puts his arms around and rocks you. My mama used to do that when I was little. My mom would kiss my tears away when I cried. And I learned that love is expressed with compassion. And my God, your God, loves you. He is close to you when you mourn. He's close to the brokenhearted. He wipes away the tears from your eyes. And after you've been ministered to in that way, that's taught you to minister to others in the same way. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercy, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Mourning over our sin results in death and gives us the ability to comfort others. Someone once said, until I learned to trust, I never learned to pray. And I did not learn to fully trust till sorrows came my way. Until I felt my weakness, his strength I never knew. Nor dreamed till I was stricken that he could see me through. Who deepest drinks of sorrow drinks deepest too of grace. He sends the storm so he himself can be our hiding place. His heart that seeks our highest good knows well when things annoy. We could not long for heaven if earth held only joy. The Lord brings comfort to those who mourn. God desires to bless us. It begins with us recognizing spiritual poverty that leads to mourning. But weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning.